If there's anything that's standing in the way of your truth reigning in our hearts and lives, may it be destroyed through the power of that resurrecting spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. God, let it walk through these aisles and raise and renew mindsets and raise and renew lives so that we stand a reflection of who you are and in the intention of the reason that you created us. To you be the glory forever and ever. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated if you would. Today, um, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, my, the message I'm preaching is through pure conviction in my life, through a circumstance that, that have gone uh, on this week and just things that God has shown me through staff devotions, devotions with my wife, um, devotions with other people. I, it's just amazing how God is just speaking through these things, but I'm going to take you to the book of Matthew we're going to read two verses there, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter number 10. So go to Matthew. We'll read three verses, uh, chapter number 22. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest command? And you've heard this preached before. We've talked about it before. He said this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. All right, Can I, let's say it again. Read it with me. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In other words, my thoughts must be God-centered. The things that I desire, my soul, my passions, my feelings must be God-centered. My heart and my soul, my eternal, my internal security, my eternal security should be God-centered. Everything about my life should amplify and seek God in every area. There should not be one area of me that is left for the world or one area of me that is given to things that are not of God. All of me. That's what that verse is saying. The greatest thing that you can do with your life is give all of it to God. Every part that makes you you. Then it goes on. And, and I want us to grab these words. He, he, he says, the, 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 this is the first and greatest commandment. Get it? Greatest commandment. There is nothing better than this. But equally as important, that's the next verse. Equally the second one is equal. It's not below. It's not something that follows. It's something that goes hand in hand. It's something that has to mean just as much to us as loving the Lord is loving our neighbors as ourselves. And he says, hey, here, you love God, and right with it, you love others. Right with it, you love them and treat them as you desire to be loved, as you love yourself, and as you desire to be treated. You do unto others like you would want them to do to you. You don't do based on who they are. You don't do based on where they are. You don't do based on what they've done or said to you. You do based on what God has called us to do, and that is to treat others with what we want to be treated with. And so in other words, I will reap from them what I sow into them, and so therefore I should not seek the reaping first. I should want to sow. And a lot of times we're like, well, if somebody would treat me with respect, I'd give them respect. That's not the Bible. The Bible says give the person that's disrespecting you respect anyway, and through that respect, you'll reap it back. You say, well, if they would love me or if they would treat me well, then I would know you love them and you treat them well regardless of who they are. And so um, this, this question was posed to us this week. Um, I live in a neighborhood. How many of you live in neighborhoods? Would you slip your hands up? You got to live on a street, raise them. All right. How many of you live where you can see houses that are around you? Maybe not a neighborhood, but you have eyesight of some houses that are around you. Um, who lives in the middle of nowhere? Anybody like that? All right. There we go. There's just a few. The man stepped out and he said, I want you to walk on your front porch in your mind. And I did. I walked on my front porch in my mind and I looked around. And he said, if you can see eight houses, tell me the names of the families that live there. And immediately my heart was just crushed. See, there's this conversation that takes place in Luke chapter number 10 between a Pharisee who thinks he's smarter than Jesus, trying to outsmart Jesus, and he asks Jesus, what's the greatest command? And Jesus said, well, you tell me. And he repeats this. He says, love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. He, he repeats it back, and, and Jesus said, you're right. And then he asked this question, well, who is my neighbor? 
And in the way this man was describing it, he, he was saying that this guy is trying to justify the fact that he hasn't been effective with his neighbors. And so he starts asking Christ, who is my neighbor? And, and, and it hit me. I preach over 420 times a year. In my ministry, I've preached between 4,000 and 5,000 sermons over the last decade. And yet, every time I preach, we're preaching on how to be like Christ, how to receive Christ, how to reflect Christ, how to reach others with Christ, and how to train them in Christ. And yet, I have not even reached my own neighbor. We stand and we say, let's go. And I have oftentimes interpreted my Jerusalem to be this church and the area around it when God has not called me to be about the church and the area around it as much as he's called me to be about my neighbor that lives next door and across the street, the ones that I am in the closest proximity to. And matter of fact, that is the definition. It's a proximity of what's around a certain place, a certain person, or a certain thing that That is what neighbor is defined as in Webster's Dictionary. It's anything within proximity of where you are. And so I I immediately had a heartbreak. I had to go to the bathroom and and, and just sit there. And and my heart immediately started stirring. And I called my wife and I was like, you know, listen, we we told you last week we're going to sell our home, Step of Faith. And so I listed it with a realtor this week. and, 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 And it hit me. I've been living there four years and now my time is limited. And just whatever God decides, we'll be moving in some area of where God decides. I have no clue. But in there, it's, I, I, I'm moving out without having an impact on my own neighborhood. And, and I, I said, once a month, can we just get together, just go around door to door in our neighborhood and, and just tell people we're going to get together maybe one Thursday night a month and just fellowship and, 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 and get to know each other and, and, and pour into each other and care about each other. And, 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 and you know what's crazy is in all my life of ministry, I have so complicated the Great Commission that I felt like I had to go far or go out into community when God has literally in most of our lives, according to our hands raised in this auditorium of being able to see houses around us, has brought people to where we live and we need to get a passion and a heartbreak for the people that are around us and, and, and pour into the lives that are the closest to us, whether that be your coworker at work that you work with every single day, or it be the neighbor that lives across the street that we don't even know their names. God help us that we realize that a 2020 vision means that our neighbors matter, that the people that we come in contact with matter. And we have got to get an urgency about seeking them out and ministering to the needs that are represented in their lives. Immediately, when, when I think of bringing people into my home, the first word that goes into my mind is autism. You know, they're not going to understand my son. Second word is childcare. What if they all have kids? You know, the, the third is, why haven't I been doing this the whole time? See, I'm going to tell you, any time that God lays something on your heart, there's always going to be a reason why you can't. There's always going to be a reason why it's too great. And even as I speak this, some of you have already disqualified yourselves. Some of you have always said, my home's not big enough. Who said it had to be big? I mean, hey, some of you might be sitting there saying, well, that's just too awkward. I'm going to tell you this. It'll be more awkward to stand before God with the blood of people on their, your hands that you did not reach because God had put you in a place to reach them than it will be to knock on somebody's door and say, I want to care about you. It'll be more awkward for the church when we stand before God and realize that millions of people have gone into an existence without God because the people of God were too embarrassed or self-involved to humble themselves and make God known. It'll be worse to stand before God having rejected his call than to get a door slammed in your face on this earth. And in here we have got to get a heartbeat that people matter. Individuals matter. Every person that has life in their body, air in their lungs that God has breathed into them, every single one of them God intentionally created because he loves them and desires them. And yet we have gone many times and just passed them on the street every single day. We feel like we're a good neighbor because we wave. And they wave back, oh, what a good neighborhood. You know, that when, when, when Halloween comes around, we're... We got the door, they can ring the bell, and they're going to get greeted, and we, oh, what a good Spider-Man you are. Max is a great neighbor, but if their eternal state does not come into our minds at some point, 
then we have got to realize that we are an instrument of God who has become dull, a light of God that has become dim, and it needs to change. In the devotions me and my wife had last night, these two verses just kept echoing this. It's amazing to me how you start seeking God in something, and then it seems like everything you hear about God echoes. It's like a reverb of what God has said. And, and so we came across these two verses that I want to share with you today. And, and if you look at the first one, one's in 1 John, and, and the other's in Corinthians. And you, you'll see this, that, that the Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, three things will last forever, faith hope and love, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It, but then it says in, in verse number one of chapter 14, following that, it, it says this, let love be your highest goal. I mean, let it be the main thing you're seeking. In, in other words, it's like this, if God's telling me to make love my highest goal, then my business doesn't matter as much as I think it does. Then, then, then in all honesty, my children being the best at sports, my children being the best in school, my children being the best at what they are, doesn't matter as much as I think it matters. This church being what people consider great is not what matters. Love is what matters, and it should be my goal. We should wake up every day. I should wake up every morning and say, God, how can I love people better today? How can I love you and others the way that I'm supposed to? And then it says this, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. In other words, God, I'm going to love people better. And, and you know what it's saying? You know what it's adding there? But you're not going to be able to love them best without the Spirit gifting you and empowering you. And then chapter number 14 uh, just launches in to all these gifts and what's beneficial to others and what's beneficial to yourself. And, and, and it would do you well to go study that. But the next verse that we're going to look at is 1 John chapter number 4, verse 11. It says, Dear friends... Since God loved us that much, all right, um, somebody answer this. How much did God love us? All right, is that the limit of his love? See, I asked myself that same question. Well, how much does God love us? And my first thought was he sent Jesus to die on the cross. But, but that puts a limit to God's love. It, it, that's, that's just the beginning of God's love. God's love did not end with sending his son for you. God's love was made known and started with sending his son. And if that's how it starts, can you imagine how deep it goes? And Paul said, I, I wish we could know. I wish you could know how deep, how wide, how tall, how far, how long, all these things I wish you could know. But then he comes back with this, nothing's going to be able to separate you from this love. I mean, we, we use words like God loves me completely or God loves me unconditionally because those are the only words we can find to capture it because our minds cannot comprehend it. If God's love began with Jesus dying and giving me purpose and creating my life, then what in the world does God's love have in store for me now that I'm 35 years old, now that I've been saved and, and growing in the Lord for over a decade? What does God have in store for me? We gotta get past it, church. God's love did not just stop when Jesus said we could be saved and therefore the church's love does not need to stop at just preaching salvation. It needs to go well beyond it because there's so much more that God's love has to give you than a ticket into heaven. There's so much more that God's love will do for you than just secure your eternity. And so it goes on and it, read it and it, and it says this, we surely ought to love each other. It goes on in the very next verse, no one has ever seen God. Get this. No one has ever been able to lay eyes on God and, and, and live. Some got to see his backside. Some had encounters in a bush. But to see God means that you're in a glorified state. And it says nobody has seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. You know what that verse is simply saying? If we love like we're supposed to love, then God will be seen in your life. Your life will become the proof of the presence, power, and the love that God has for other people. My life would become the message, the example of God. Now, I'm going to say, oftentimes in my life, and I'm going to say it for you too, oftentimes in your life, we haven't been the example of God that we need to be. And therefore, there's been times in my life that people weren't experiencing the expression of who God was. They were experiencing the expression of my own selfishness, my own desires, and my own wills. Anybody say, yeah, me too, been there, done that? Yeah, but now, it is my call, and yours as well, 
to live in such a way, loving God so much that that love becomes available to others. And we have got to get to a point in our lives that we take this seriously. So when Jesus was talking to this Pharisee, and this Pharisee was saying, who is my neighbor, we find the story of the Good Samaritan. So in Luke chapter number two, would you flip over there, and let's look at how Jesus answers this question of who is my neighbor. And, and, and so in, in chapter uh, number 10 of Luke, uh, we'll start reading in verse number 29. It says, uh, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a story, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Verse 31, by chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to him, the, uh, he, 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 the Samaritan sued his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. I, 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 if, if his bills are, uh, runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And Jesus asked this question. Now, which one of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go do the same. Understand, back up. You see different things that are going on here. And so at first we see what's the neighbor. The neighbor is anything that's close to your home, anything that's close to you. Those are things that you would consider neighbors, anybody within your proximity. So right now, where you sit, you have neighbors, all right? It's the people sitting beside you, in front of you, behind you. They are your neighbors. When you came to church today, you should have tried to impact their lives. You should have tried to make connection with their lives. You, you know, and it'd it, it do you well in church not to get assigned to the same seat. It'd do you well to move around and be a little bit mobile so you can reach more people. But we're just like the world. We're human just like the world. We like comfort zones. We like people that we already know. And that is why when the church does Bible studies or we open our home, we typically invite people we already know. We rarely invite the people we don't know. We go after the people that go to church with us or to another church. I mean, the church is trying to evangelize the church. And that is why evangelism isn't working. Evangelism is the spread of the gospel. And if you're in the church, if you're saved by Jesus' blood, you've already got the gospel. Where the expansion needs to happen is the church needs to take the gospel to the other people who do not have the gospel, and we need to be reaching out to them. Is small groups a good thing? Yes, we should be growing together, but it should not be the only thing we do. We should not just have small groups that are based around believers. We should have groups that are based around the unbeliever, based around the people that don't go. Uh, yesterday, as we are at Mobile Life House, one of my favorite things that they do is at 10 o'clock, there's a church service. And, and I was telling Nick before we got started, I said, brother, do you realize that, that, that the preachers that get to come preach in these services, most of them don't even get to preach to that big of a congregation on a weekly basis in their church? You've got people that are coming in for food and you're giving them Jesus. This is church. This is what it is. It's taking it to where it needs to be. It's getting it out for those that need to hear. But you know what I have found? And the temptation's already even in this building. That the more we talk of this, the more numb the church has already become to it. And the more numb we become when we hear the Great Commission, we get sick and tired of hearing it because churches and Christians alike have become more involved in what they can bring into their lives than what they can put out of them more involved in what they can bring into their bubble instead of what they can put out because of what Christ has put in. And so we have got to get to a point where we realize that it is great to disciple, but if we're not careful, our discipleship will die out as believers die out because we're not reaching those who are dying without Jesus Christ. And so we have got to reach out. And so look at what happens. You see uh, an example of what a bad neighbor is. So here's a Jewish man, and here comes a priest. In verse 31, what's the priest do? He sees, and he crosses the road and goes on the other side. You know what this is called? Ego. 
This is somebody, a bad neighbor is somebody that feels like they're better than other people. Better than. Too good for a situation. Too good to pour into somebody. God help us that there's nobody that we think we're better than or too good for. But we don't look at them and say, ooh, I don't want a part of that. We don't see the need and go the other way. Or you see the second, another bad neighbor is the, the busy one. The, the temple assistant that he sees him, walks up to him, I'll be praying for you, and turns around and walks away. All right, can, can we be real? A lot of times in church, we're so busy trying to get to our next appointment, trying to get to our next meal, trying to get to our rest or our, our afternoon nap, that, that we want to blitz away from people instead of taking time to, number one, recognize the need, and number two, pour into the need. See, there, there's a problem in my life when I let my ego come in and I say, I'm too good for this, or when I let my busyness take over and I don't have time for this. And I'm going to say this, let's say, and let's be real, our schedules as human beings are cluttered. We have way too much we have committed to. I teach this all the time. Matter of fact, me and Travis had a conversation about it this morning. The best ministry word that opens up doors for ministry is to say no to things that God has not called you to. To say no to circumstances that you don't need to be involved in. And the problem with a big heart is you want to say yes to everything. All right? And then guess what happens? You get stressed. You lose sleep. You can't fulfill anything. And the next thing you know, you feel like you're worthless because you're not able to keep up with the demands of life. You know what would clear that? To say yes to the things that God has called you to and no to the things that he hasn't. Because when we are saying yes to the things that God has not called us to, not only are we not able to do it well, we are hindering the person that God has called to that from the opportunity to do it. And so therefore, I need to understand that there's certain things that, that, that I don't need to do. But when it comes to people, I need to be available all the time. And if I'm not available to people, then there are idols in my schedule. There are things that are keeping me from being able to serve God the way that I'm supposed to serve God. And you're keeping me from doing the things that I need to do to reach the world for Christ. It blows my mind that I can preach that many sermons on reaching people for Jesus and never once have reached my neighbors. That, that, I mean, it's conviction. And so in there, I'm guilty of the second, and sometimes the first, definitely the second, and then the third creeps in as well, selfishness. You know, if you've got ego, you're too good for. If you're busy, you don't have time for. If you're selfish, you have no need for. I don't, I don't care about other people when I'm selfish. I only care about myself. Matter of fact, if, if you are struggling with any type of sin, know this, you're not battling sin as much as you're battling selfishness. Jesus won the battle for sin. He gave you and I the authority through the Holy Spirit to rule over sin, according to Romans chapter number eight. And also in the passage that we're reading in today, matter of fact, I think it is Luke chapter 10. If you back up, and, and I didn't give her this, it says this in verse number 18, 19. Look, I have given you authority over all power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes snakes and scorpions and crush them and nothing will injure you. I mean, that's the authority of Christ in our lives. And we say, I'm battling with sin. No, you're battling with selfishness. That's what you're battling with. The Bible says sin comes from our own desires that entice us away. And at some point, we've got to realize that we have got to stop being selfish with our lives and we have got to start caring about the people around us. And a good neighbor does the complete opposite of these three things. So I, can I tell you this? God gave me this. I want to share it with you. I have never read an obituary nor been to a funeral where someone stood on a stage and said, Dick Keep had the biggest, nicest house. I've never been to a funeral where they, they list all the things about him and say, this dude had a lot of money. No, I mean, you've never been anywhere when somebody has died and passed where they talk about accomplishments. Every place that I've gone, every obituary that I've read, it lists, this is who died, and this is his family. This is her legacy. In the paragraph you get when you die, your accomplishments will not make it, but the people you've impacted will. 
And I have stood at many funerals and heard people stand and say, hey, this person God used in my life and God changed my life. I know they're in heaven. And they rejoice as they can tell because the lifestyle that that person had, it was an expression of God. And they know that to express God, you have to have God. And because you have God, you are now with God. And they stand and they talk about impact. I'm going to tell you this now. Uh, our, Our greatest thing we can do with our life is impact others. Because I'm going to tell you this, our personal goals and accomplishments, they do not change other people's lives. People will never remember what you did for them. They'll never remember what you gave them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And at some point of our lives, we got to understand that heaven is just like the obituary. At some point, you're going to stand before God. I'm going to say to you, God does not care how big your house is, and God does not care how big your bank account is, and God doesn't care how much you've accomplished in your work life, in your career. What you will stand before God with is and give an account for the people you've impacted. Just like at your funeral, that's all they'll talk about, or that's all they'll lack, and they'll mourn because it wasn't there. When you stand before God, he will not bring up all the things you built. He'll bring up all the people you reached. And I want to stand before God not empty-handed when it comes to reaching others for Jesus Christ. Anybody else in here say, yeah, me too. I, I, I want to go out there and reach the world. I mean, I'm going to tell you this now. Church, we're so busy with things that don't matter. It's not even our neighbors that we're in danger of not reaching. It's the very children that live in our own homes two doors down the hallway. We're so wrapped up in everything else that our little boys and little girls aren't being raised with moms and dads that love the Lord. They're seeing moms and dads that are in pursuit of happiness. And I'm going to tell you this, you can pursue happiness your entire life and die totally sad. But you can pursue God your entire life and die totally fulfilled. And at some point in our lives, we've got to realize that our neighbors matter. So look at this. Good Samaritan gives us eight things in closing. Eight things that we as a good neighbor should be doing for the people around us. All right, ready? Let's start. Uh, Pick up, if you would, in in verse number 33, and it it says this. A despised Samaritan came along. I love that word because it means this. It's somebody that the normal would reject, but God's going to use them anyway. And for those of you that think God can't use you, measure yourself by this. How much are you accepted by the world? And if you say, not much, Good job. Here you go. You're the one that God can use. He can use the people accepted too. But understand this. Uh, I, I would rather be accepted by God and rejected by the world than be accepted by the world and rejected by God. And so at some point in my life, I've got to get to a point where I'm saying, I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to serve the Lord, even if you don't think it's the right way, even if you don't like what I'm doing. I'm going after God. I told my wife last night with tears in my eyes, I looked at her and I said, the things that God is calling us to do right now in this season of our lives will not even make sense to our own families. I'm seeing it to be true. When we start telling people what God has laid on our lives, what God is calling us to do, we are not often met with support. We're often met with the reasons why we cannot. And I'm going to tell you this. If God is for it, no one can stand against it. But I'll guarantee you this. You can either go with the popularity of what people say or you can follow the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you this now. They will never fulfill you like the Holy Spirit will. And in this, I don't know what life has in hold. I do know distractions pop up. I do know attacks happen. But when God makes something clear, make no mistake of it, he will not abandon you in the process of seeking him. And when God lays it on our hearts to open our homes, to reach people, yes, it's scary. Yes, you don't know who's coming in. They may rob you. Good. They may help you get out some of your clutter. But the thing is, is understand, you and I cannot live in fear of what could happen. We need to be in a total acknowledgement of what will happen to the world if we do not reach them for Jesus Christ. And if hell doesn't shake us at our core, then we are messed up. I mean, it is real. It's literal. And I I cannot stand when people try to explain it away. I hear people say all the time, well, hell's not real. God would never send somebody to hell. You're right. God never has sent somebody to hell. He gave them the way to not go to hell. If they go to hell, they've most time chose it or we made the choice for them. You say, I've never chose to send somebody to hell to not preach the gospel is to make the decision for somebody else. To not share Jesus is to decide for someone else. And you and I should not ever make the decision for someone else on whether or not they deserve a chance to go to heaven. That's where the go should come in to the Great Commission. Go into all the world and reach them. And so we sing a song, 
I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. The cross before me, the world behind me, and we love it, and we lift our and then we go out, and it's the world before me, the cross behind me. It's, I'm not going unless somebody else goes. It, it, it's, I ain't following Jesus unless I'm with the crowd that's following Jesus. And if I'm not with the crowd that's following Jesus, I'll follow the crowd. And we have got to change. And we have got to realize that some mindsets have to change. So look at this, what he did. This is not an easy message to preach, because I know it doesn't make me a hero in most eyes. But God help us. If we ain't going to care for other people, if we're not going to reach the world for Jesus Christ, then let's close. And not just close the service, let's close the church. Because it is totally worthless if all we're doing is building our comfort zones. If all we're doing is big, building our egos, then I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to spend 16 hours here today stroking my own ego. I want to spend 16 hours today holding on to the throne of God, knowing the power of God is slipping right through my life into the life of others around me, praying that every person that comes into these doors, every person that walks into my office, every meeting we have is an encounter with God that no one can leave the same for. Maybe just like Moses, they have to stay a little bit, take their shoes off, get down and worship and realize that something's coming out of the bush that has never came out of the world and something is happening that they do not want to escape. I mean, I want to see people raised up to be leaders instead of hiding in wildernesses. And I don't know about you, but God help us that that become a heartbeat. So number one, look at what he does. He sees the need. In verse number 33, the Bible says, he saw the man. Number two, after he sees the man, he felt compassion. He cared about their needs. If I'm going to be a good neighbor, i got to see my neighbors. I, I, I need to acknowledge them. When I see them, I have two neighbors that live near me that I don't know if they know the Lord, but I do know this. They've been more of a neighbor to me than I've been to them. I was out there, and I told y'all several months ago, trying to dig up and cut up a tree trunk by myself. My neighbor heard me with my ax hitting this tree trunk and, 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 and came over, brought a shovel and gloves and came over. And he said, it, it sounds like you're hitting a rock. It was a holly bush, and he said, dude, he said, you're never going to be able to pull this out this way. He said, there's roots that are intertwined underneath this that you cannot see, and some of them grow straight down, and you have no idea how deep they are, and you're going to be hitting this thing all day long, and all that's going to happen is you're going to be wore out, and that had been the two or three days of my life leading up to that. I was sore, and I was hurting, so he went and got his truck. He got chains. He hooked it up. He yanked it out. You know, and I'm like, okay, thank you. The other night, they, they came over about a two months ago. 10 o'clock at night, rang our doorbell, came in with fresh baked bread, sat down and gave it to us, started talking about our internet and how bad it is, but just spent about 30 minutes, 40 minutes sitting there talking to us. And from the way they talk and the things they say, there's a great chance that they do not know the Lord. And yet they've been more of a neighbor to me than I've been to them. Something's got to change. A lot of times we see the person that we don't want to talk to. We see the person that we know is going to be down. And what do we do? We go to the other side of the road. We, we, we get out as fast as we can. We get away as fast as we can. We see the person that stinks and we avoid. We dive into a bathroom. We dive into a back room. We, we, we tell the kids not to move and we hide in our houses as if no one's home. I can't be the only one in the room that's done this. And yet we come to church and we act like we care. We sing songs about caring, and, and, and we act like we love the Lord, but we cannot. We cannot truly love God if we don't love people like the way that God loves them. And I am thankful today that I can say that God has never gone to the other side of the road when it came to my condition. That he's never left, he's never forsaken, he has always pursued. Anybody else in here have a thank God in that moment too? Number three, not only does he care about the need and condition, he wants to get close. I mean, look at this. It says that in the very next verse, going over to him. You know, God help us that as a church, when we see the needs of our county, when we see the needs of our neighborhoods, we want to get involved. I mean, I don't have any idea what God is doing in my life right now, but he is, it is 
it blow in my mind. I keep passing land thinking this is where we should build our orphanage and this is where we should do this. And, 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 and I know that if we build an auditorium on this property, we're not going to be able to build any other building. But I know that in this church alone, there's over 20-something foster kids. And I know that in the next few days, four of them, their parents are signing over rights and they could be lost into a system to where they'd never be rebounded. And I cannot sit back and just let that happen. The church has to step up and say, we can do something about this. I told somebody the other day, with as many builders and carpenters and things that we have in this church, we should be able to throw up a house for nothing. With as much people that are in here that are working and the resources that God's bringing in through our lives, we should be able to fund it and not have to take a dime of loan on it. The children of God should be so equipped and so ready that when we step out and say, this is what God's called us to do, our selfishness hasn't gotten in the way. Our busyness doesn't steal us away. And there are people that are in need, and yet we're so stuck into what we need. And my heart is breaking, not over your condition, but my own. Because every time I hear God say, do this, and every time I see these visions, and every time I get scared to even talk about them. But it's coming at such a rapid rate. I look at people that go into recovery programs and then get kicked out of recovery programs because they weren't able to immediately obey every single rule that the recovery program have. And I understand it. You've got to protect your program. But then they're just stuck back out on the streets like there's nothing to do with them. And I'm thinking, man, what if we were the recovery program that picked up the people after they were kicked out of the recovery program? You say, well, those are the hard ones. Those are the ones we should go to. The ones that have no hope that everybody else says, okay, we can't. We should be willing to step in and say, Jesus can. Jesus can. I mean, all these things that are going through our minds, at some point we have got to get over there and, and get close to it and say, okay, God, we will do this. And I know you and I are labeled a small church, and I don't even care what the world considers, whether we're small or large. I, I, I don't even know, but I know that God has given us multiple resources. We'll have a second service that has just as many of you sitting in it. I don't care about you, but I have learned what the Bible has to say is more important than our logic has to say. And if just a few people can go rebuild the walls of a temple, rebuild the walls of a city within just record time because they had the mindset to work, then what could the church of God do if we just got our minds unified with God's instead of unified with a world culture of living for ourselves, living for our feelings, living for the things around us, living to impress people. I am tired of being impressive. It's exhausting. I want to make impression. In other words, I don't care if you like me. I want you to know that you can love this Jesus that loves you. And that is the most important thing that we can do with our lives. So he goes over to him, number three, number four, look at it. He says, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with, with olive oil and wine, and he bandaged them. Not only does he want to get close, he wants to minister. You know what that's called? He wanted to follow through. Um, Brother Dick told me this before service. Last week we did our missions analogy. If you were here, we picked one person and I brought one person up, then I sent that person out with me and we picked another and we just kept doing it and within no time it was multiplying tremendously. I only reached four people but there was still 30 up here because of the people being reached through discipleship. And when I got to Brother Dick, he said this. He pulled me down today and he said, there's something powerful that you said to me last week that needs to be reiterated to the church because I believe it was missed. So when you got to me, Brother Dick um, has had an amputation and Brother Dick has gone through many surgeries and uh, has recovered and is recovering beautifully. But Brother Dick made this statement when he stood up at first, there was this, should I bring him up here because he has a hard time walking? And I looked at him and I told him, I will not let you fall. And he said, the church needs to hear it. That there's got to come a point that we don't only take Jesus to the world, but that we put our arms around the person and say, I will not let you fall. I will be here with you as you grow. And this guy gets over to him. He ministers to him. And that's what he does. The next thing is he puts him on his donkey and he says, I'm not leaving you here. You're going with me. And look at this. It alters the man's plan. We don't even know where the Samaritan was going, but we do know he took a detour. I mean, his plans were not as important as the person that was laying there in need. 
And it's an okay, it's okay to dream and it's okay to vision, but your desire for your heart should never be more important than the needs of others around us. And the Samaritan loads him on the donkey. Number five, not only did he minister, he, he, he makes the need of that person, the priority of his life, decides to take him with him. Number six, look at this, he invested, he gave money towards the needs. He goes to the innkeeper and he says, here's two things of silver. Um, you use it for their bills. Well, he should pay his own bills. Mm. Should people work? Yes. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. That's what it says. But sometimes people aren't in the condition they're in because of things that they've done. Sometimes they are. And that's where the Holy Spirit gives you discernment. You know, if somebody's had six, seven months of paying none of their bills, they have a lifestyle that needs to be worked on. But if somebody all of a sudden walks into work today and gets fired, laid off or gone, or maybe one of their kids becomes up ill or one of their family members becomes terminal, and they sink their resource and they sink everything into it, it's not because of what they've done. And the Samaritan is looking at a Jew who is not in the condition because of decisions he's made. He's in the condition because of what's been done to him. The hurts and the needs of that person mattered. And so what did he do? He took of his own time, he took of his own resource, and he says, use this. Use this to help them recover. You know, you know one of the scariest things to talk about in the church is to ask people to give to the Lord? It, it, it is terrifying. Everybody wants to excuse it. But I've often wondered, what if God took the same attitude with your wallet as you take towards his calling? What if God gave to you according to what you give for his kingdom? And notice, I'm not talking what you give to a church. I'm talking what you give to the needs of furthering the gospel so that other people can be reached in the name of Jesus Christ. Should the church be a good avenue of that? Yes. Has that been misused in churches? Yes. But to God be the glory, I'm praying that we never have that be the reputation here. I mean, look, debt may make sense to you. It does not to me, and I will never take it. And I know people say you'll never have another building without it. So be it. Let's go four or five services. Some of you are going to have to stand up and preach. Some of you are going to have to take some lead. But God, help us that we're not so caught up in our own selves and materialism that we bind ourselves to where we're not able to help the needs of others. You know, and so he goes in and he says, hey, here's two coins. Here, you'd use it. That's a substantial amount of money in this day and time. And look at this. This is, don't miss it. After he ministers, he invests in the recovery. And that investment is made of his resource. But that's not where he ended. Number seven, if you look at it, he was willing to do whatever it took to get the job done. He says, if it cost more, Here's what he's saying. Do it anyway. If it costs more, don't stop. You do whatever it takes to help him recover. I'll, I'll pay it the next time I come, which is number eight. He planned on coming back to that person again. He planned on returning to that Jew again to see what was going on in their lives. God, help us that the church stops believing they're a good church because they baptized. And God, help us to believe that we are a good church because we will return to the people that God has reached. We will return to the people that God has called, that God has positioned. We won't be a one and done church. We are going to follow up with you to make sure you're growing in the Lord like you should be, to make sure your needs are provided and a good neighbor doesn't just invest in it, a good neighbor has full intentions of coming back to it to make sure that that person's okay. In other words, it's like this. If Tammy comes up to me and says, I need you to pray for my family, the next week I should go up to Tammy and say, how is your family? It shouldn't be something that I have forgotten about. It should be something that I intentionally remembered so that I could follow up on. How many of you have ever met somebody important before? Anybody like that? Slip your hand up in the air. How many of you have ever come in contact with them again and they remembered you? Slip your hand up. Now, how many of you have felt pretty good that you were remembered? Yeah. I can see it in people's faces when I make the mistake in the store or at an event or somewhere in public. I'll walk up to them and I'll say, I know you from somewhere. And they'll say, I go to your church. That should never be. You, and we can justify, right? Oh, there's seven or 800 people. There's no way you're going to remember them all. God help me, I'm never going to accept that excuse. 
They should matter. Each person should matter. Each person should mean something and should be made to feel as such. We should remember, I, I, I'm terrible with names, I'll, I'll remember your face, but I should remember the things that make you you. If a little girl comes in loving Scooby-Doo, and I happen to be walking through a store, or maybe even in a thrift store, and all of a sudden there's a ton of Scooby-Doo DVDs, I could radically impact the rest of her life by reaching over and purchasing a few of those. And the next time I see that little girl, hand them to him and say, Hey, I remember you like Scooby-Doo. Check this out. You say, well, I don't believe in Scooby-Doo. That's not the point. The reality is, is we should know what other people are going through, and we should keep it on our hearts and minds. In other words, it's like this. A good neighbor cares about the needs of their neighbors, cares about the situations and trials and struggles that their neighbors are in. A good neighbor recognizes the hurts of the neighbor's heart, and a good neighbor wants the success of their neighbors to be evident and experienced in their homes. And God help us that we would become better neighbors. Real names, real faces turn into real passion and real ministry. So can I show you a picture? And I know I didn't ask permission to do this because sometimes I get told when I ask permission, no. I don't like being told no. See if I can make this work. Give me a second. Today I'm going to make some resources available to our church that by the time, this time next week, you're going to be able to experience God in your homes on a more intimate level and not only experience Him, but be able to share Him. But yesterday, as I was at Mobile Life House, um, Jerry was preaching a very, very solid sermon on delivered. I mean, multiple times he was sharing what God had done, and he was saying, delivered, delivered, delivered. And it echoed in my mind, delivered, delivered. How many people will go through their entire lives never being able to say that word because nobody ever tried to reach them to deliver them? So after that service was over, they had an invitation song, and they gave an opportunity for people to come and pray, and I caught this. I've never taken a picture at Mobile Life House because the identities of people matter, and it is not a publicity stunt. We are not there to expose people in their need. What good is that? In this, there is no identity, but you know what I do see? Life touching life. I told Jerry I had to take this picture because the passion that is all over Jerry's face in this photo. And I looked at this and I thought to myself, this is neighbor on neighbor. This is people reaching people, caring about the needs of others. And so this week, we are calling on our church to do something that's different than we've ever done before. Whether you're watching online or whether you're, you're, you're sitting here present, we had a vision two years ago that our church would open 100 small groups and homes. And so what we're asking you to do is not to open a small group based on people you know, but to open a small group based on the community you're in to where you go to your neighbors and you reach out to them. And so I believe Ephesians 4 tells us as a church it is our job to equip you with the tools necessary to be able to help people grow in love so that we can be unified as a body. Jesus even prayed his desire was that we would become one just like he and the Father are one. Unity was his goal. And so we put together a little packet, a little letter that's in here of things that, I, I, that we wrote down. I wrote them for you. Things that you would need to remember as you step out in faith to take on this call that God is putting in your life. Hey, just a few, your insecurities will be magnified. Hey, you, you will need his word. This does not replace your church. Matter of fact, we wrote this statement. We do not need to replace the walls of fellowship with God's people within the church with the walls of our own home. Instead, the walls of our home should expand the walls of fellowship that God has said within his church. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2, the Bible says that the people 
hey, they came together, they fellowshiped together, but they met together daily at the temple. Don't buy into this junk where people say that the early church didn't go to church. Yes, they did. 5,000 people met together after the days of Pentecost in just a few weeks every single day. The Bible says in Solomon's colonnade. You know what that is? In our church, that would be what you would call the portico or the awning that you pulled up under to drop people out. They didn't go in the church because what they were preaching wasn't accepted by the church, but they still got together as the church, and that is unified and important. It goes on. There's 10 things. You can check it out. We've even put a mock invitation Something that you can take with you door to door. On the back it says you should love your neighbors as yourself. And in it, it's just an area for you to write your name and to write a time and say, hey, here's some statistics, ready? Neighbors who stay connected on average live longer. Neighbors who are connected live longer. Number two, crime rates in neighborhoods where the neighbors know each other are 60% less. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to being a good neighbor. So you can go door to door. We made it. Then we gave a little study for your family. The Art of Neighboring. A small group guide and a six-day study that you and your family will go through with video links that you can get to for free. A little thing about how to throw a block party in your neighborhood. You say, what is this important? We have got to get Jesus out there. And so our church has invested and it has been an investment. And so in this, we are offering what we call Right Now Media. Next week, every person here will be able to sign up for a free account. It costs you nothing. Right Now Media, this is on an Apple TV, so you can see it. Right Now Media is an app that's downloadable by your phone or anything. It is a life-giving resource, an abundance of Bible studies that, that have been just put together by, by people that are seeking the Lord on every single topic. And they are DVD studies. They're getting together studies. If you go up to the top, you can tell that there's, there's a whole library that's just centered for your kids and different movies and things that are centered around God that will teach your kids the things of God from a young age so that they can learn thousands and thousands and thousands of ways to get closer to God. You say, well, I don't know what to teach in my Bible study. We've got it right here for you. You don't have to go search all these resources in the library. You can go right to your television or right to your cell phone. And so today, we need your email address. If you want it for free, that's all we need. And then next week, starting next Sunday, there'll be a link on our website. There'll be areas that you can go into. Right now, we have been able to partner with Woodstock for a temporary account. But you'll see Grace logo up there, and you'll see that there's different things that you can study. And you go in, and you just click. You find what you want to study, and then all you got to do is hit play. Get your notebooks out and let God work in your life. Our staff has started doing a Bible study together. Our elders today are starting to do a Bible study together. Me and my wife have started doing Bible studies together, and I am seeing immediate change in my own heart from being willing to get together and to learn and to grow of God. I find myself a lot stuck in traffic or, 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 or sitting in a hospital waiting to go somewhere or, or, or tied up, and I, it's on my phone. I just pull it up, put my headphones in, and I am able to get the word of God made real, literal. Now, I'm not saying that everything on here is biblical. That's why you got to be a student of the word. Make sure that it lines up with the Bible. There's no way that I can proof all of these. But I do know that there is some great things from God on this. See, church, we live in a generation where it's easy. And yet we act as if it's so complicated to reach the world. And so today... Can we stop for a moment, just a moment, and can we just pray and ask God to help us see people the way he sees people and to care about people the way that he cares about people so that all will have a chance to hear that there is a God that is madly in love with them. And because of that, he has given you a community that will help you grow and experience the best life you could possibly experience. He searched to and fro, seeking for someone who would fill the hedge, and then said I, here am I, Lord, send me. So this week, I have full intention of going to the eight houses I can see to start with, 
getting their names. There's actually a sheet in your little thing. We'll give you a magnet next week we've ordered to stick on your fridge. It's just a little grid that all it's intended to do is for you and I to get the names of the people that are around us and write them down on a little square thing around our homes so that we can remember to pray for them and to care for them and to seek them out because our neighbors truly do matter. They matter so much that God wants you to love them as much as you love him. So let's say goodbye online. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. No music, no movement. <laughs>